I hope everybody is doing well, is happy and is healthy, preferably staying away from college campuses. <laughs> we are hoping that we get through this okay and that we'll be able to open up our gates but we're really waiting to see you know if it's just a mess we don't want to open up and have to shut back down but in in positive news we have a handful of longtime volunteers who are coming in and helping us get ready to open back up because we've been shorthanded all summer all spring and summer so we're we're getting tidied up and we're hoping we'll be able to, to be open at some point, not too distantly. So today we're going to talk about the Styrax family, the Styracaceae family. And it's, it's kind of an odd group in that they can be difficult to tell apart even when in flower, which a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, plants we separate when they're in flower, the different gene, genera in the Styracaceae, but their fruit are all pretty different. So it's easier to, a lot easier to tell what they are when they're in fruit than in flower. Depending on your taxonomist, there are 11, 12, maybe 13 different genera in the family. We've got in it 160 to 180 species, maybe, although there are new species being described pretty regularly from both Mexico and Central America and from Asia. So, you know, kind of Vietnam is, is just, we're just learning about some from there and, and China. So we're going to go ahead and I'll share my screen. Because it's much more interesting to look at the plants than it is to look at me. Getting worried it wasn't going to show up there for a second. So the Styracaceae, and we, I've kind of arranged it by the different genera, but you know, I just put some photos in here so you could see some differences in the flowers. And we'll, we'll look at, at these as we go on. I mean, you can see where, you know, a lot of them are just white flowers. There are a few pink, pink ones in there. Um, you know, so the flowers and then the fruit, and like I said, the fruit is a little bit easier to tell them apart. Styrax generally have kind of rounded or oval fruits that, you know, start off green or silvery gray and will slowly turn brown and crack open and have one or two seeds in there. While Sinojackia, another one, will have these kind of elongated capsules that have this line right there. Halesia, or perhaps more appropriate, Halesia, have these winged dry fruits that have generally one seed in there. And you know, we have Terastyrax, Alnephylum, Heterodendron or radarodendron, which have these huge fruits. It's hard to tell the scale on that, but that's probably six or eight inches long and it's a big old heavy thing. So just, just to show you some of the, the variation, but we're going to look at the plants individually. So most of the, the Styracaceae are in, in Asia, like a lot of plants. We have two genera in the U.S. and they range from the eastern U.S. all the way to the west and then quite a few down in Mexico. 
I don't know much about those, the ones from the neotropics in, in Mexico and Central America. Um, I've never grown any of those. We've grown a few from Mexico, but never, I, I just, it's not a group I know well. And then there are some that grow down through Malaysia that I don't know as well uh, at, at all, really. So Alnophyllum is typically a pretty, you know, medium to, to large tree. Grows uh, throughout much of, of Asia. Alnophyllum fortunii is certainly the most common one, named for Robert Fortune. And it's got these kind of small flowers. Most, most of the Styracaceae will have flowers in panicles or racemes or clusters, although there's a few that have just, just individual flowers. There are three species of Alnophyllum, three-ish, depends, sometimes they're, they're separated out in very small reasons. Most of the Styracaceae, most of the family will have pretty smooth bark, like you can see here. One of the, the defining characteristics, which is not universal, but is to have these stellate hairs, these kind of star-shaped hairs on stems and young new growth and twigs and things like that. So that's something that you do often see. Now, Alnophyllum fortunii is a really beautiful plant. As a young plant, it can be kind of thin and it doesn't, like, so, like several of these, doesn't necessarily take your breath away until it gets to be a bit larger. And as it grows larger, it's, it's showier and showier. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of limiting it, tried to limit it to ones that are at least a little bit available. That's that the other Alnophyllums, there's Alnophyllum eberhardii and I'm drawing a blank on the other species, but so boy, I should have left this group to the end, the the North American Halesia or Halesia, because there's there's some taxonomic disagreement about these plants. So I'm gonna give you kind of the two sides. The flora of North America separates Halesia, and I keep saying both names. It's named for Stephen Hales, so probably you could call it Halesia, but I've called it Halesia my whole life. I always learned it that way, and I'm hard pressed to stop now. So the flora of the floor of North America separates out Halesia into two species. Halesia diptera, which means two winged, di two and terra are wing wing because the seeds are flat and they have these wings on there. And Halesia Carolina is what floor of North America. Alan Weekly, the, the taxonomist botanist at, at UNC Chapel Hill, who's, who I use his flora in progress. But for anything east of the Mississippi, I really think his is, is the best. He, he splits... He splits it up, Halesia diptera. So he's got Halesia diptera, but he splits that to variety diptera and variety magnaflora. Halesia carolina, which is much different than the floor of North America's Halesia carolina. I should have put all this down on a slide. Halesia tetraptera and splits that into variety tetraptera and variety monticola. So I'm going to start with the Halesia diptera. So Halesia diptera, variety diptera, is basically distributed where you see here. It, it, 
the Allen Weeklies. It, it goes from South Carolina or so, North Carolina, really, over south to the Florida Panhandle and over to, to East Texas. And it is a variable species. And uh, some researchers have said that we can't separate these, this variety Magnaflora, which is really just in Southern Georgia and the Florida Panhandle, because there's variation in, in Halesia diptera. But variety Magnaflora is pretty different than the other species. The Halesia diptera is really more of a, a shrub to small tree. Excuse me, I take that back. They're, they're all kind of small to medium trees, although variety Magnaflora will grow quite a bit larger. But the, the variety Magnaflora flowers are at least twice the size of regular Halesia diptera. So even if this variety Magnaflora is botanically not different plant, if you are buying a North American native Halesia, this is the variety Magnaflora is going to be what you want because it is so much showier than the straight species. It's pretty rare in the wild, but it's actually the one you most often see in the, the you know, for sale anywhere because it is so good. And I will say, well, this plant right here is right outside my office. And last year, for whatever reason, maybe maybe it's because this spring we didn't have volunteers. Whatever the reason, seedlings germinated under it like nobody's business. And I happen to know that we have quite a few in our nursery that we have potted up and they will be available at some point from us. Not sure if that'll be as giveaway for members or if it'll be in a plant sale or what, but we have a lot of them that are growing off really well. I was looking at them just on Monday. So expect to see them. Like a lot of the, the Styracaceae, but not all, it mostly flowers before it, it leafs out, but you can see it will start, you know, as it, while it's still in flower, it will start leafing out. But also like most styracaceae, it's got nice white flowers, kind of, they're often companionate or bell-shaped, although sometimes they'll open up and they can have various numbers of petals. So, and there you see that two-winged, that diptera two-winged fruit on there. So, flora of North America does not recognize Halesia parviflora. They say this is all part of Halesia carolina. This is a much different animal than what you know, if you put all of Halesia tetraptera into Halesia and Halesia parviflora into Halesia carolina, it is this group that is just so huge. So in the sense of parviflora, that means small flowered. This is a, really a shrubby plant. And this is kind of deep south, South Carolina, down to the Florida panhandle and over to Mississippi. So it, it's flowers aren't as big or as showy as Halesia diptera magnaflora, but because it's a smaller plant, it shows off much better. And you see it kind of flowers in these little clusters and kind of goes a little pink as it ages. But really, by the time you get a lot of aging on the flowers, it has mostly leafed out pretty well. So this is more of a shrubby plant. And most of these lesias, like this one is growing pretty low areas, often right, right by brackish water. And so does the Halesia diptera magnaflora can, is a plant that could probably work very well in a, a rain garden because they can tolerate dry soils, but they, they, off, they also grow often in places that are periodically inundated. So then Halesia tetraptera, and I put in a picture of this, the rosia cultivar, but I think this is 
all white in the typical tetraptera. So in the the floor of North America's kind of concept of Halesia carolina, this is it. It's very, very widespread. But Alan Weekly separates this, and, and we follow that into Halesia tetraptera monticola, which is the mountain Halesia, which grows kind of up Linville Gorge, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, kind of the, the Smoky Mountains area, you know, kind of right in here, grows as a very tall tree at high elevations, whereas Halesia tetraptera, variety tetraptera, is more of a shrub to small tree and is pretty widespread, like you see here, but almost always at lower elevations. So, that confuse y'all all with that. And there are some, especially, especially the variety Tetraptor, there are some, some neat forms like this old variegata. I think this is a better form, the Tyler's variegated. You don't get quite so much distortion in the leaves. But you can see on here on the young growth, all those hairs on there. Well, you can see it on both of them, really, that you get very often with uh, the Styracaceae. So there is one, perhaps, Halesia in Asia, Halesia McGregori. And this is one that I managed to collect, wild collect last, last spring, last fall, excuse me, when I was in China, kind of in this area right here, and we collected it. This can, is a fairly large tree. When I first learned about it, I was told it was evergreen. It's not evergreen, but it, it's in flower, a beautiful plant. And as it gets older and older, it just gets showier and showier. It's very heavily flowered. And it has those winged fruits like, like our native Halesias do. Now, there are some taxonomists who put this in a new genus called Perkinsiodendron, which jury's still out on that. I haven't really read the papers on why they separate this out, that, this out away from uh, Halesia. I think, prob I think the, in some DNA work, it shows that it is not really clustered with our North American ones and it kind of sits in the middle of another genera. So that's probably why. But it's very distinctive. I have seen some photos in from I think Australia and maybe from southern the southern part of England showing fantastic fall color. I have never seen that so I don't I can't can't say on that. But we actually, we don't have this plant out in the garden anymore. We lost it, I believe, during the two, after the 2007 drought is, I believe, when we lost it. But that's, that's the foliage on it. And really, when you, when you see it out in the wild, it looks very, very much like it wants to be evergreen, but apparently it is not, even in lower elevations. Now, kind of a head scratcher, because this is one that I know of as an evergreen plant, is this Huodendron, Huodendron tibeticum, which we have grown, we grew for quite a few years. We, we quite a, a bunch of our Styracaceae collection in the past were kind of here where the our, the McSwain Education Center is now. So quite a few of them were removed for the building. This is one that I do want to get back out in the garden because I think it has great potential and especially as we've warmed up even more so. But it it is evergreen pretty much as far as, as I'm concerned when I've seen it, it's been evergreen during the winter here in central North Carolina. Interesting, the 
the floor of China says it's deciduous. And I've never seen it be very shrubby, but then again, there could be a lot of genetic variation. And you see it's kind of scattered around through China. But the bark on it is just beautiful. It has this kind of cinnamon, mahogany, smooth bark that peels off. Sarah P. Duke has a beautiful plant, or did, I, I, I hope it's still there, but it was limbed down to, I mean, it was, it's had foliage down to the ground and branches down to the ground. I, every time I go over there, I say, limb it up, limb it up a little bit so we can see the bark. This picture is actually me, you know, in the plant. It's got a flat, I've got using a flash because it's, it was so dark under there. Now, I have never seen it in full flower, but this is flower buds getting ready to flower from a plant in England. Never seen it in the wild. I was hoping last year, we were down right in here, I was really hoping to see it, but I never, but I, I did not. And there are four species of that, of, the, of huodendron in, in Asia. You rarely, rarely ever see, you rarely see them for sale. And when you do, you rarely see any other than Huodendron tibeticum, but it is a first class plant. I'd really like to collect it and see if we can collect it up at a high elevation where it might have a little bit more hardiness because it is a little, what's mostly grown is a little tender. Now, in my mind, perhaps the, the queen of the, the whole group is Meliodendron. Meliodendron xylocarpum. There's only one species of this unless we discover a new one sometime. Again, last year where we were collecting, one of our goals was Styracaceae, and that's because we were there and we did collect Styracaceae. We did collect the, the Helesia, this Meliodendron, and one Styrax. But this this very much flowers look like a Styrax flower. If you, if you know a Styrax and you see that flower, you would think it's a, a Styrax, except those flowers are often two inches across. Usually they, they start flowering often as early as February. You'll get a nice pink bud that opens to pink or sometimes almost pure white flower. Flower color in the Styrax, in the Styracaceae, there are some pink forms of otherwise white flowered ones or, or like this, ones that can be pink or almost pure white. Flower color is very much tied to temperature, almost always. It is tied to temperature. If it is cool, we have nice cool springs when it's flowering, you will often get more pink in there. And there are some pink forms of Styrax that I'll show that if they don't, if they start flowering and it's really warm, you'll have white flowers. You won't even be able to tell hardly that it's pink. But then you get these fruits, which are quite distinctive. Again, that is, you know, you can hold one of those comfortably in your hand. Two of them are gonna be a lot to hold on to and three of them, in one hand, you're probably dropping one unless you've got, unless you're a basketball player. They are big honking things. We've grown this at the Arboretum for a long, long time. We lost the, the one in, in underneath the crepe myrtles at the fantasy circle. But one of our friends, Suzuki-san at Garden Kinosato, gave us this one. He had shown me a picture one year of, he had a flower and he had it next to a ruler and it was two and a half inches across and it was the deepest pink meliodendron I'd ever seen. And he showed me that picture and kind of laughed when I said, oh, wow, can I get one? Where is it? What, you know, and he was like, no, no, no. And then the next year I went back to Japan and he uh, presented me a plant and it is growing here in the Lath House quite well. This was picture taken 
this past early, early spring, late winter. And you can see, I mean, I love this with, with this plant since the flowers are big and showy. It's nice that you see it opens. This is one that's just getting ready to open. So the flowers open individually, but it'll often have multiple flowers at each of the, the leaf axles here. So if it starts flowering in February and we get a cold burst and they turn brown, there'll be more flowers coming out. So unless it gets really, really cold as they're, they're flowering, you will have good flowering on it. What's more, I would have told you that this was definitely gonna have to be grafted, but we have rooted it quite successfully in the past and at least one of those we gave one to a nurseryman it was so we had rooted it over the summer we gave it to him the next the next summer so it was like a year old rooted thing in our little three and a half inch pots and it the next spring he had he planted it out and it flowered for him the next spring I've got one that I didn't put in the ground quite as soon as he did. I didn't do it till the fall, um, last fall, but it's, it's three or four feet tall now, and I'm certain it'll flower next year. So this could be a super exciting plant for, for people. It's certainly exciting for me. Those are two inch pink flowers in February and March. That's not bad. So now going back to, to another a more, a slightly more obscure genera, Pterostyrax. We have grown several of these over the years. This is the most common one, probably the most widespread, Pterostyrax corymbosus. And you can see it's growing from, you know, Shanghai area all the way up through the mountains. This is, you know, this is coastal, southern coastal plain there, very, very tropical. But this is, this is the kind of the Nanling Shan Mountains and some other mountains in there. And these, these are mountains that go up into this way. And then there, what you're really seeing is, is getting up into some of the like Ime Shan type mountains. So, you know, these do go get up into some elevation. So they do have pretty good hardiness for several of these species. This Pterostyrax corymbosus is one of my favorites. This, unlike the Meliodendron and the Halesias, this doesn't flower until later spring. So it is leafed out when it flowers. So, but because the leaves kind of are up and the flowers hang down a bit more, they really still are show off. They don't, they aren't obscured by the flowers, by the leaves. So beautiful plant can get to be, you know, 30, 40 feet tall over time. I have a bit of a love hate relationship with some of the Pterostyrax. Uh, sometimes if you do a lot of gardening under them, they can, they'll root sucker. but they are a beautiful plants, so it may be worth it. And, and that's the fruit on there, that Pterostyrax corymbosus. Now, some of the Pterostyrax, and I can't remember if I put a picture in, have much skinnier fruit, and they can all, some of them are really covered with hairs. Under, I might have a post, picture of, oh yeah, there's Pterostyrax silophilus, so you can see that fruit. That's actually a fruit I collected last, last year when I was in, in China. But you can see this has kind of overlapping in some parts of the range with Pterostyrax corymbosus, but they are very distinct. And you can see it's almost like a, a honey locust when they flower for us in the spring. And you see this one starts flowering just as the leaves are opening. So it's kind of these little white icicles hanging down, but then it's got that smooth bark and the foliage looks good until the end of the season, unlike our, our honey locusts do now. And it doesn't get quite as big. And you can see this is a one that 
was allowed to grow with a double head. So it's a little bit wider. Normally it's a little bit narrower headed plant. But again, a gorgeous plant, 30, 40 feet tall. And a lot of these grow as understory trees. So if you have high shade, they're, they're great to plant in that kind of area. Pterostyrex hispida. Again, you see these are the flowers on these, on all of these, let's see, you see here and then this, are less petals and more of, you're seeing the, the stamens and reproductive bits and the, the petals are very, are much shortened. So it's kind of a frillier flower. So the flower doesn't look quite as pretty up close, but in a tree, you know, as these are opening, that's really quite pretty. So hispida means hairy. And when you see the fruits on these, the fruits on these are like really hairy and, and kind of skinny more like this. And again, any of these, if you can get your hands on them, they're worth it. There's actually a really nice form of Pterostyrex eberhardii that I don't have pictures of that where somebody who, a friend of the Arboretum is, he gave us one plant and he gave it to somebody personally who shall not be named, who may or may not be giving midweek talks weekly uh, for a botanic garden, may have given it to him personally to bring to the Arboretum and it got forgotten at his house last year when it was very dry and hot and didn't survive. So he did promised another one and said he wouldn't leave it with anybody that was that negligent with their plants. So he'll, he'll drink, bring it straight to us. But it's a super showy one. I don't have any pictures of it in flower, but hope to get that and then hope to propagate it and be able to get it out to other people as well. Now, you know, I'm always, there's always kind of these, these plants that for whatever reason take my take my fancy and I have a hard time getting past them uh, until I can grow them successfully. One of those plants is oh sorry that's that's the fruit of of that pterostyrex. Oh I got more in here than I thought. Oh that's right. This is an unnamed new probably new species from uh, Vietnam. It's quite showy. I saw in Cornwall. Who knows what it is? But Reheterodendron. And this is not my photo. This is from the University of British Columbia because I have never seen, I always call it Reheterodendron, but it should be, it's named for Alfred Rader. So Raderodendron, I have never seen it in flower. Uh, Raderodendron macrocarpum. And this is actually a photo, that's JC at the University of British Columbia, I believe. We have grown it here successfully, and I think it should grow just fine here, but I haven't grown it. And the fruits are these big old long heavy things. And I've asked somebody who grows this, how do you, how do you germinate it? Because they're it's this it's super hard and the seeds are long. They kind of run almost all the way through this, and it'll have two or four or more seeds in there. And he took me into the woods, kind of on the edge of his nursery, and there were some stakes in the ground with string around them. And he said, "This is what I do. I put them in the ground, and come back every year and look there and see if." anything has germinated yet. And he said, sometimes it takes two years, sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes five or more. It just waits for this whole thing to break down, which I am not that patient. So we are trying um, with that. I think it's important that it's outside. So I think it needs to, you know, get some of the acid from our soils and rain temperature fluctuations to break down that outer coat. They can get pretty big. I've seen these 40 or more feet tall. They kind of got a glossy 
foliage. They're very, very pretty. Um, and the fruit can be very, very pretty. You know, that's to me, the things, those fruits on that one are about three or four inches. And they turn bright red and hang down on the, the plants. This Gongshanensi, which is just from a real small area in China, it comes over into into the India and like Assam area as well. But it is, you know, those red petioles. There's everything about this. I think is beautiful, and the. I don't know if it's the weight of the fruits, but mature plants always seem to be very graceful and have limbs hanging down and they, they trees photograph terribly. So it's, I don't have good photos of the whole trees on any of these. Now one that I am more familiar with that is, that does excellent here, Sinojacchia raideriana. And these are more shrubbier, small tree plants. This is one that was growing right along Barrel Road for quite a while. And you can see, again, that area where I was last year. There's just so many of these, this family in here, which when we were collecting, they had had a drought. And so collecting wasn't great for these because these big, you know, plants with big seeds, big fruits, it takes a lot of energy for that. So if you have a drought, they tend to uh, abort the, the fruits. But this is a plant that just covers itself in, in flowers, kind of, again, right as the leaves go. And it can be, it can sometimes have good fall color, but not, not reliably. Those, those are the flowers of it. Just very typical for the, the family, the white petals and then all those stamens that with the that are nice and yellow. I have a hard time telling this species apart from this species, Sinojacchia xylocarpa. Now Lagrima is a cultivar we have that was named here in North Carolina. It's a very upright form of this plant. And I've, I've told people this before. It was named teardrop, Spanish for teardrop, because of the shape. But if you know your Spanish well, teardrop is las lagrima, all one word. And I am told that the best definition for lagrima is something akin to the feeling you get when somebody scrapes their fingers down a chalkboard. So perhaps not the best name for this plant. It's, the species can be kind of a rangy plant. It's not always a beautiful, beautiful formed plant, but this, this lagrima is spectacular. It goes upright, often multi-stemmed, although you can keep it to one stem if you want, but very much goes upright. It, you know, with age, the branches, uh, you know, kind of fan out, but as a young plant, very, very narrow. So it's good for like a street planting or by a sidewalk or, you know, if you have a small space by your your, your driveway, because since the plants go up and then arch over, you get some shade, but as long as you limit up, the branches are gonna grow up and out, not straight out at your, your face. Tends to be a little bit smaller, but, all, but can, grow, can grow to be pretty good size. And it just, the flowers on Lagrima especially, if you go back and look, you know, you see how open these are, you get that really nice star shape. These really have these overlapping petals, so it's, the white is much more of a contrast. And when our tree out here by, it's right by our visitor center, when it's in full bloom, it, it just stops people in their tracks. I mean, absolutely stops them.
and it's it's blooming in you know, usually in in April or so. All right, now we're getting to the big boy in the group. This you know, 130 species. I only put you know, 125 in here. So no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Don't everybody get off the computers right now. I did not. I I did some kind of some of the more common ones, and then also some of the the outliers and some cultivars in here. So we'll we'll kind of zip through them. So the Styracaceae, like I said, there's 11, 12 genera in the Styracaceae. There are only two in North America, and there are only two in the New World. Let's we'll say in North and South America, or at least only two that have been discovered so far. So we have the bulk of them here in our part of the country. So Styrax americanus is, you see grows uh, kind of through, throughout the Eastern part of the, the US, mostly in the South. It is a, often a fairly shrubby plant, kind of flowers right as it's, it's, it's starting to leaf out. Can be kind of thin and wispy. It's, it's a great plant if you want to grow native plants. It's, it's a neat plant if you have a lot of space. If you're only going to grow one Styracaceae plant, you know, I don't know if it would be my top pick, but I've got a woodland area and I have recommended that we propagate some Styrac americanus, not this one, but this cultivar, Baby Blue, which comes out with these, has these silvery blue hairs. So it's got just a little more interest to it. I have suggested that we propagate this for sale because I want to get one for my woodland area because I do think it's a nice plant and I like a lot of these um, Styrax. So, you know, there's, we're, there aren't many named forms of our, of our native Styrax, uh, so it's nice to see to see some out there. I will mention there's a there's a native one of our native Halesias. I don't have a picture of. That's a really good pink form called Rosy Ridge, and that originated growing naturally in, in a natural area on the property of. Hawks Ridge Farms, one of the one of the nurseries that's really supportive of the arboretum, and it's a great plant. So if you see ever see that one, you know, snap it up. It's a it's a really good one. So the other Styrax that we have in the east is Styrax grandifolius. Yeah, so it's got grand leaves. It's got pretty big leaves. The flowers are pretty small. This is a picture taken by our own Tim Alderton, growing naturally down you know, right, right here in Raleigh along Crabtree Creek somewhere. So, you know, this is, this is very much native and it's, it's one of those plants that if you don't catch it while it's flowering, you probably just walk by. It's one of those things you look at that and say, hmm, I wonder what that is if it doesn't have flowers or fruit and you're not quite sure what it is. One way that's often a good way to, to identify plants in this family, and I, I should have pulled a picture of it, I didn't, but the, the bark often has kind of pale striations or stripes along the bark. Not super noticeable, but if you look at kind of the, not the youngest wood, but not the oldest bark, but things from, you know, a quarter or half an inch up to three or four inches, you'll often see that. And that's often my first clue that this, that a plant might be a Styrax or a Halesia or something like that. Now, Texas is interesting with their Styrax. There are the Styrax platinifolia, so it's sycamore leafed Styrax, silver bell. I don't think the leaves look anything like a sycamore, but they're kind of, they can be kind of big. There are three subspecies in Texas. 
of Styrax platanifolius. And they all grow down here on the, on the Edwards Plateau. Well, two of them, I'm sorry, two of them grow on the Edwards Plateau, which is right at, uh, right near the border there, including this subspecies or variety Texanus. And then there's one that is in the Davis Mountains that goes into, into Mexico. But these tend to be shrubby plants. The subspecies Texanus, this is, this is a picture from our plant growing in the Zeric Garden here. It's endangered and really only found growing on kind of real inaccessible places because it gets eaten by deer and other animals out there. It's a plant that they will graze on. And it's more of a smaller shrubby plant so they can just, just kind of chew it down to nothing. But it seems to grow really well for us if we put it in a, a well-drained spot. I'd like to propagate it and try it in, you know, more average garden soil and see how it does. But it's got big flowers on a small plant, pretty big leaves, but it's a neat, it's a neat little thing. I didn't, I didn't put a picture in it, but there is a Styrex that's native to Southern California. Styrex Redivivus, and then there's a bunch going down through Mexico and, and Central America. There's some really nice pink flowered ones that are, you know, kind of subtropical that we can't grow. Oh, went backwards. Got confused there. All right. Now, the bulk of them are going to be in China, although there is there is one that's in Europe and Africa and some that are, that go down through Malaysia. So I'm going to go through these pretty fast because a lot of these are very similar. So Styrex calvescens is kind of a nice plant, kind of thinner, wispier flowers, attractive, but, you know, not one, not a 60 mile an hour plant. It's not going to stop you when you're driving fast, but strolling through the garden is nice. Usually shrubbier than, and wider than, than tall. Styrex formosanus. I don't know what this plant is, I'm, if I'm being honest. See how widespread it is. Uh, Formosanus implies that it's from just from Taiwan, but it grows all through China. There seems to be a lot of plants that are called Styrex Formosanus. I'm not always sure if that's correct. This is, the, this is our plant growing here in Asian Valley. I think it's correctly identified. I've gone out and keyed it out a few times with the flora of Taiwan because that's where it was collected. And I've seen maybe four or five different species in, in Taiwan, uh, or at least subspecies, but this is the one that has done the best for us. Styrex hemsleanus is kind of grows in this central and can get pretty far north, so it can get pretty, pretty cold tolerant if you get it from up in the mountains here in, in the, those Wuling Mountains, has big foliage and then the flowers are held in kind of these tight clusters which are kind of not held upright but held outward from the plant so it can be very showy. I don't know how fragrant this one is. There's a very similar one that I'll show you that's very fragrant and some of these are fragrant and some are not. I am, my nose isn't good enough to be able to tell for most of them though. This one, which is very similar, you see it's got this large leaf and then these tight flower clusters, but they tend to hang down rather than out. Styrex obasia. This grows real far north. You know, if you're collecting from up there, you can grow this sucker, you know, up in Boston and, um, places like that. The ones that are down through here are probably better for us. But Styrex obasia is one of the few plants where I've seen it growing in a courtyard and had it in flower and I could only stay in that courtyard for a while and I've got a terrible sense of smell but it was overpowering. You know, 
think of jonquils in your house. It was absolutely the fragrance over overpowered me. But a neat plant, it really, all the plants that I have experienced, Styrax beige, if they're grown out in the open, they all get this really beautiful, nice outline. And I, I just think they're, they're attractive. I'll, I'll show another picture of the fruit when I get to the Styrax japonicus. But it's these, you know, as the fruit form, they're these little marble sized gray fruits that dangle off from the tree like this that I think are really attractive as well. Oh, and the one that got away, Mr. Suzuki, who gave me the Suzuki pink. At the same time, he showed me that picture, picture of the Meliodendron. He showed me this picture of a leaf of Styrax obasia. And again, he gave me a plant of it the next year when I went to visit him. We did not manage to keep the plant alive when we got it back here to the Arboretum. So I need, I know where he is, but he seems to always have different plants. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping I can get back to Japan one of these days soon and hoping he still has it because we like he a lot. So again, another smaller flowered one. This is called the mock orange silver bell or, or snow bell. Excuse me, snow bell. Halesias are silver bells, Styrax are snow bells usually, or, or Storax sometimes. And there's another small kind of thinner, wispier plant. It is supposed to be fragrant, but it's not a fragrance that I have, I have really been able to, to smell much. Pretty, but again, I think there are finer ones if, you're, if you have limited space. Styrax, Wilsonii, this one I really like. This is more, this is a shrub. It can get to be a large shrub, but you can trim it back. But it's one of the most profusely flowering Styrax I've ever seen. Fla individual flowers are small, but it just flowers so heavily. And it's late enough flowering that it really gets you past the, the biggest bulk of the spring flowering shrubs. Kind of Get, keeps you going, you know, as you go into that late spring lull. This one is is one that'll that'll keep you kind of going through that to the into the almost early flowering shrubs, uh, summer shrubs. But I think just a gorgeous shrub. I'm sure you could thin it out and try and get it to grow as a as a small tree, but I think if you did that, it would get too wispy for you and wouldn't really do it. It's from a very restricted area in in China, but but uh, an area where it's getting starting to get pretty cold as you're getting up closer to the Himalayas, and so I'm not sure of its ultimate hardiness, but I would think very very hardy. Now for something completely different, Styrax sherianus. This is from Japan and hasn't been really in Western cultivation for very long. I haven't seen a big enough one that's really flowering to, to really know how showy the flowers will be. You know, these terminal clusters are really nice, but there's only one in the leaf axle, but this is a young plant. But look at that foliage on there. You know, most every other foliage in here is either kind of narrow lancelet to kind of big, wide, ovate, oval leaves. Most of them have maybe some minor serrations, but nothing major. And then this one all of a sudden just breaks the mold. It's like somebody had ripped the leaves in half on Sherianus. So I just, for as a foliage plant, I think this is spectacular. And it is I understand uh, shrubby to small tree, but I have not seen a large one yet. I would love to collect this in the wild and see, you know, what kind of variation is out there because we're really, we're working with a very limited amount of germplasm in Europe and the U.S. with this. I think a lot of the material has come from the same sources. 
Now, Japan, the big, the big boy there in Japan, and China, it's very widespread in China as well as Japan, is Styrax japonicus, first named in, in Japan, but, but it does grow in, in China as well. And this is, you know, the best known for sure. And that's because it really is the showiest of them all. So the straight species, you know, can be variable in form depending on where, where it comes from. Will generally always flower after the leaves are, have emerged. Often still while the leaves are still growing, but the flowers all hang down bell-like while the leaves, the new leaves kind of grow upwards. I hear it described like, you know, butterfly wings above the, the, the snow bells below it. So, you know, April for us, May, uh, late April going into May, is when you'll typically get the flowers going on there. And it can be, a, a nice tree is just breathtaking. These are those fruits. I love Styrax in fruit. I think, I just think they're really nice. Styrax japonicus is actually one of the best ones in fruit. They're really, they'll start silvery gray and then go brown before finally splitting to reveal usually a single seed, but sometimes two. And I just think it's lovely. And so you can see this is finished flowering and everything, but you can see, still see how the, the leaves kind of arch up over the, the branches like that. Love those fruits. And there are a lot of selections that are out there. So there are weeping ones, quite a few weeping ones now. Styrax carillon is kind of the, the OG weeping Styrax. I'm not sure the, where, where they first, first originated, but beautiful plant. The Arboretum is well known for probably the best known plant from the Arboretum or the one most more people associate with the Arboretum is Styrax japonicus emerald pagoda, which we'll get to, but the Arboretum has named other ones. And actually my favorite of the ones that they've named is this smaller shrubbier one that was named Crystal. And the reason I like Crystal is because it has these dark, purpley black pedicels and, and um, calices. And so when you look at this plant, it's got this, it's not kind of that pure, pure white. It's got a different color tinge to it that's from these. And then it has, you can see it's got the, that dark coloration in there. You see how dark the leaves are on there, dark green they are, compared to often a, a much lighter green depending on the selection. So I really like Carolina. It's more of a smaller, shrubbier plant, finer flowers. One of these days I may get ambitious and key it out and see if it actually is Japonicus. It, it grows just a little bit different than typical Japonicus, but who knows. Emerald Pagoda, like I mentioned, that's the one that, that we are really known for. JC collected it on Suhuksan Island in his, when he went to Korea in 1985, and then this was released about a decade later. The reason it has become so popular is, one, it has a very upright kind of nice habit. This is, you know, kind of what people are often are looking for in landscape trees, that nice oval head. And then the flowers are easily twice the size of, of many other Styrax japonicus. It has very, very large flowers. There was some thinking that it was, there's a variety called Fargesii, which is kind of bigger in, in all its parts, leaves, flowers, fruits, than typical Styrax japonicus. But when DNA work was done, it was found that this was, uh, was, this was not a, a tetraploid, which Fargesii is, and so it's it's just the species, but great big flowers, so very very showy. And if you ever see 
it, it it's it, well you can find it in the trade but every once in a while somebody will still have this as styrax japonicus suhuxan which was a name that jc distributed it under but that was just kind of a placeholder that it, that was the name that was where he collected it so that was just to distinguish it from other styrax japonicus and then when when he was introducing it he um I think I think maybe Bryce Lane came up with the name Emerald Pagoda. Now there's a great purple leaf one. There's been a couple purple leaf ones that have been released. The best one, in my opinion, so far is this one, Evening Light. And you can see flowers are pretty much pure white, but then they have that purple pedicel, kind of like crystal, and then the the purple leaves. And I just, I think it, it's beautiful. And it wants to be a little bit more of a shrubby plant and grows up white. I have seen it grown as a single stem plant, you know, limbed up and it's beautiful that way, but it's also beautiful as this kind of upright, multi-trunked small tree or, or shrub. And I do, I don't know where exactly this came from, but I would not be surprised if the, if Crystal was involved in the parentage. The other one that came from the Arboretum that I don't think I put a picture in is one called Snowfall. And that was selected. There was a, a line of seedling grown plants on the on NC State campus and JC named one of them Snowfall for it. It had a more regular head and outline. There's some newer um, weeping ones. Fragrant Fountain is one. In my mind, so far, our plant has not flowered as well as Carillon typically does, but supposedly the flowers are more fragrant. I, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't terribly fragrant to me, but um, that's okay. It's a pretty plant. There's some variegated ones like Frosted Emerald. If you have a lot of money to spend on a plant, you can buy one of these often. If you've got the perfect spot or you live in the Pacific Northwest, you might even get it to live. It's, there's not much chlorophyll in there and it, it does not like Southern sun. Uh, so really got to get it enough light that it can photosynthesize, but not too much. If you find that spot, it's a neat plant. This little one, uh, Masako, uh, which you can see this, I don't have a picture of it in flower, but it's a little dwarf congested thing with, and you can see all the flower buds that are going to open on there. It's just going to be just like amazing. There are some pink weeping forms. Pink chimes is one of the best named ones. There are some unnamed seedlings that we have that are great. They're just rubra pendula group is what we call them. And they have these pink flowers, but this is one that can be affected by the amount, how cold it is when it, when it's, those buds are, are getting ready to open. If it's, if it gets really hot, they can be white and more white than pink. And pink chimes is kind of the upright one that's, that's pink. And again, I have, I could probably have, I don't know how many pictures of this same exact plant, same selection. And I kind of turned my nose up at pink chimes for several years until I caught it this year, this one year where I took this picture where it was unseasonably cool in Atlanta. And um, it was, it was real pink that year. Oh, there's snowfall. So I do have a picture of snowfall. If any of you have Snowfall, we don't have it at the Arboretum anymore. It was distributed multiple times. If anybody knows they have Snowfall in their garden, let me know because I would like to get it back since it was an introduction of the, the Arboretum. And I'd like to grow it again to, to really see it. It's not one I'm really familiar with, so I'd love to get it back. And then couldn't, couldn't go without letting you know that there is one in Mediter the Mediterranean, kind of on the 
Europe side, it kind of goes from Italy eastward and then kind of down into the Middle East. If you ever hear of storax resin or, or you know, it's used for incense, that kind of thing, that comes from Styrax officinalis. It's you know, kind of interesting as an oddity, I guess, very disjunct from everything else. So it was long winded. I know I was going to fly through those Styrax and I just, I can't, I can't do it. Um, I'm, I'm terrible that way. So this is what is going on the plant sale buggy. A few things have been on there before, so you can go to our website and see them. One that's neat is this Adena rubella, purple flower form of the Chinese button bush. Very cool. Look for our newsletter to see a little bit more about this plant. If you're a member, you're going to have the opportunity to get something very cool with that plant. So keep an eye out for that. Our number one pollinator plant probably in the garden for, for summer, this um, Sarissa that we named Bumblebee Delight. Stachyurus is always fantastic. This is a great Arborvitae, Europe Gold. And then this uh, somewhat hardy um, Tibicina. Um, it's over, it overwintered for me last winter, but it was a pretty mild winter. So, you know, that's not saying much. Um, they're easy to propagate or you can bring it inside if, if you're worried about it. But those will all be out on the, the plant cart tomorrow from 8 to 4. So, whew. Oh, sure. I got through quicker than I did do some days. I'm happy to answer any questions. Chris, okay. Chris, you see Linda said she's not getting the newsletter. The newsletter goes out twice a year. It, it gets emailed and, and or mailed to all of our members. Um, so if you're not getting a newsletter, let Chris or Catherine Wall know and we can make sure you're getting it. Make sure you're a member if, if you're not. You can also older newsletters, you know, we do post, put them on our website. So there. Kathy Hornbuckle, uh, always looking for the odd thing. Did any have uh, con have contorted stems? I almost put a picture in of one that I just have as uh, Styrax japonicus unryu form, which indicates these contorted stems in Japanese. I have never grown the plant, but I have seen it in Japan. Another great reason to go back to Japan. I've never seen it in the US or in Europe, so, but I know who has it in Japan. Let's see. Oh, you have one. Ho, 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 ho. We may need to do some, some horse trading there, Kathy. That's, uh, I'd love to get that and graft it. So, we will connect on email there. there. The weeping form is, I mean, it's certainly out there. In fact, it, it, the, the weeping ones are maybe easier to come by sometimes in the trade than other ones. The, both the pink and the, the white, they're both beautiful. Fragrant Fountain has been very popular recently. Uh, a lot of nurse, I've seen that uh, in a lot of nurseries where they'll have, you know, two or three, often higher dollar, but they're, they're great plants and, and Styrax are really tough. Let's see. So the Halesia Carolina, 
Halesia Carolina is, it's really, you don't know what you're getting with when you get something just called Halesia Carolina. And that's the problem with the flora. It could be a six foot shrubby plant that's from the coastal plain, or it could be an, a 60 foot tree that's growing in mountain areas, high elevation mountain areas in North Carolina. So that's the biggest issue with something called Halesia Carolina is if it's being named according to the floor of, of North America, it, it could be anything. So that's why I, I prefer. And Meliodendron, we have, we have got, had okay fall color on Meliodendron, but not you don't grow that one for for its foliage for sure. Yeah, you answered answer that one. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Meliodendron, our Suzuki pink started flowering. I know it started flowering in like mid-February. And as Chris mentioned, it was flowering in when we shut down, which was March 17th. So it flowered over a long period. It did get cold in between there. There were, there were flowers that were damaged, that, some of the early flowering ones. And so while it was cold, it kind of just sat still and didn't, it wouldn't open up flowers the whole time. And then once it warmed up again, it started opening again. It's actually one that may do better as you get where it stays nice and cold until later. I, I have a feeling that if we had, you know, two weeks of really warm weather in January, it might start trying to flower, flower then. Anything, any other questions that? Mark? Yeah. We've got, we've got a pair of the Emerald Pagodas mm -hmm. uh, that we got from a giveaway back in 01, I think. So they've been in the ground for a number of years. And they kind of, they came out as a multi-stem, which was beautiful, great form and stuff. Last year on one of them, some of the inner branches inner big stems start, started to yeah. die back and then we've cut them out. Is that to be expected just because of their age? Do you think? Well, I mean, that didn't, you know. Or do you think disease might be an issue? My guess is we've had some really wet weather, periods of really wet weather over the last couple of years. And, you know, when they're multi-stemmed like that and coming out just because of the way Emerald Pagoda grows. My guess is it, there was some water that was, sit, you know, was sitting in there, and there's probably duff, you know, leaves breaking down and duff grow, going in there, and the water would get in there and just sit. And so, I, my guess it was probably causing some fungal problems in there. That might make sense because because I think it also started to get kind of a dark, very dark brown, almost black coloring Splotchy. to it, splotchy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. So we cut all that out, but the rest of it looks okay. Yeah, I think, I, I think, you know, as long as, you know, it didn't, as long as that wound heals up okay, I think it will be just fine. They're really tough plants. Yeah, Styrex Evening Light is an awesome plant. It is so good. And to Paul, who said that. What we need to do is, you know, we're getting a plant breeder in and she's going to start in January. Need to get some Styrax Evening Light crossing with Carillon and Pink Cascade. We need to get some Purple Leaf Weeping Pink and White forms of Styrax Deponicus. I'm sure somebody's working on that, but wouldn't that be nice? And that Evening Light, there was another one that was like party dress or party gown or something like that. I can't remember the name. That was a purple leaf one and it had this really matte leaf and it just it didn't hold stay green very well. And evening light is 
uh, this glossy leaf and it stays, it is one of the best purple leaf plants, trees we grow in terms of holding the color in South Carolina. So yeah, good, good point, Paul. Purple dress, uh, Mark? Purple dress? I think so, yeah. Purple dress, yeah. That sounds that right. Seems to be online. Yeah, I, all of them, all the styrax are wonderful plants. There is not an ugly one among them. There are some that can be grown ugly, you know, some of the kind of thinner, wispier ones, if they're just, they're too shaded, whatever, they, they don't grow well. But, but yeah, you know, full sun to, to part shade for most of them. They really tend to be understory trees and they do great. Well, thank you all, everybody. Happy to answer any questions um, people have. Look forward to hearing from Kathy Hornbuckle about her, her contorted Styrax. And look forward to seeing the rest of y'all in person one of these days. Have a good week. Uh, I'll be back next, next Wednesday. Thank you so I'll much. Be, I'll You're be right. waiting for you. I'll be here. <laughs> okay. Bye, Thank everyone. you. Take care, all. Thank you. Hey, Chris. Great. Very great. Thank you great. so much. Oh, it's my pleasure.